Welcome back to Cross-Cultural Communication and Management. This is Topic 3 of the Lecture on the Taxonomy of Diversity, or Cultural Values. There are five topics in this lecture. This lecture covers the five most cited fundamental concerns that all human societies need to have in order to form a human's culture. We have address group attachment and hierarchy acceptance. The focus of this topic will be gender association. This is our reminder slide. We learned that fundamental concerns are building blocks that all human cultures need to have. There are many of these concerns, and the list can be endless. One way to solve the problem is to categorize and put them in a framework. Here are the five most commonly cited fundamental concerns in the literature. The focus of this topic is a cultural element called gender association. It is important to note that the cultural values of masculinity and femininity, as depicted in this lecture and textbooks, do not reflect the same construct from Hofstede. Although the labels are the same, the definition and application significantly differ. Gender association is defined as the extent to which people are associated with masculine or feminine traits. Masculine traits are competitiveness, ambition, independence, strength, and assertiveness. Feminine traits are caring, modesty, gentleness, empathy, and sensitivity. These are very old concepts, but were considered values of a collective culture through the work of Hofstede. However, I have to admit that both the term and the definition are problematic. First of all, it has a branding problem. At the universal level, both sets of traits are needed for any human culture and any individual to survive. The traits are unisex or sexless, but the terminologies of masculinity and femininity put a men and women's face to it. There is consequence. It is possible that a man would be under the pressure to show masculine traits and vice versa. This may perpetuate sexism in the society. This could be worsened when gender roles are directly incorporated in cultural definition. For example, Hofstede defined that masculinity stands for a society in which men are supposed to be assertive, tough and focused on material success, while women are supposed to be more modest, tender and concerned with the quality of life. In contrast, femininity stands for a society in which both men and women are supposed to be modest, tender and concerned with the quality of life. Such a definition equates gender role with gender association. All neutral and sexless traits are only embedded in gender roles and nothing else. It doesn't leave any room for cultures where both men and women embrace masculine traits or cultures where gender roles are reversed. Which leads me to the second problem, a cross-cultural one. Being masculine and feminine can mean different things in different cultures and different contexts. In many traditional cultures, men are expected to be feminine, caring for children. But in some other cultures and contexts, women are expected to be strong, to fight and protect their community. Third of all, it has an update problem. Gender roles are not fixed. In the past, men could be associated with work and education. But nowadays, women are coming close to men in being breadwinners and earning university degrees. In fact, the sustainability of our modern workplace is requiring both men and women to be competitive, assertive, but at the same time, showing empathy and caring for others. So femininity and masculinity are not perfect terminologies. We really need to choose different names to categorize these traits. But for now, we are kind of stuck with this problem. To minimize it, I would encourage you to use the traits and not the terms. At the collective level, each country, group, and organization associates more or less with feminine or masculine traits. Here is again a list of collective cultures. Let's make a guess of which one is highly associated with masculinity and which one with femininity. So we have a choice between Sweden and Italy. Among CEOs and engineers. Among baby boomers and millennials. Among Buddhists and Christians. Among teachers and soldiers. And finally, among women and men. Stereotypes can be useful to answer these questions. 
but if we apply these oversimplified, and sometimes incorrect ideas to individuals, there would be harmful consequences. These questions also remind us, of many cultures within a society, and the coexistence of opposing values. More often than not, masculinity and femininity are intertwined. For example, we often think of soldiers' culture as very masculine. I come from a family with military background, and my partner is a soldier in the Australian Army. What I learned from them is that, a soldier's job is to protect, and save life. It could be a feminine goal, that sometimes has to be achieved, with a masculine act of taking a life. So complex a culture can be. And rightly so. Culture has to be dynamic, because as a survival strategy, it cannot stay still. At the individual level, do you identify as a person highly associated with femininity, masculinity, or both? You can, of course, add one more possible choice. It depends, and you are right. We've mentioned in this course many times, the capacity of building a multicultural mind. It allows us to switch values spontaneously, in accordance with a specific context. This is a level where each individual is unique, not a representative of her, or his culture. Each individual is also dynamic, changing, switching, or having opposing values at the same time. Because gender is such a powerful concept, I would like to share with you, a very interesting, and also controversial study. So the finding of this study shows, that men tend to have brain connectivity within each hemisphere. And women tend to have these connectivity between, or crossing two hemispheres. The study concluded that, male brains are structured, to facilitate connectivity between perception and coordinated action, such as motor task, whereas female brains, are designed to facilitate communication between analytical, and intuitive processing modes. The study, has a big impact. Many popular press immediately jumped on the conclusion, seeing this as a solid evidence, that men and women are biologically different in the brain. This, explains why men are task-focused, and women are good at multitasking. On LinkedIn, I even saw an executive using this study, to advocate for women in the management. He said that, because women have a different brain, their strength in negotiation and communication are beneficial for business. This, is a typical case of neurosexism. What I can tell you is that, the study has a lot of criticism. The brain scans don't lie, but the conclusion and interpretation can go too far. Critics said that, the researchers crossed the line, when they gave the conclusion, that the brain of men and women were structured, and designed that way, resulting in superior behaviors. Differences in structures, do not lead to differences in functions in such a simple ways. It is also possible, that such a difference is meant to compensate for other differences, such as in brain size. And so they serve to make men, and women more similar, not more different. Even more problematic, is when the researchers themselves told the newspapers, that the brain is hardwired that way. This means the difference, is pre-programmed, predetermined, and fixed, regardless of culture, education, and other external factors. However, their own data shows otherwise. The connectivity changes from children, to teenager, and young adult. Another issue is that, these images only show the differences, between males and females. The similarities count for a greater deal, but are not presented. This way of presentation, gives the impression that men and women are mostly different, while in fact, that they are mostly similar. However, the strongest argument, is vested in two words, that we are already familiar with in this course, brain plasticity. Those men and women, were probably not born that way, but have become that way, thanks to brain plasticity. Neurosexism is a serious problem, both in the academia, and especially in popular press. I'm sure you've heard about this book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. This kind of pseudoscience, perpetuate sexism with the false idea, that women, and men, have two different kinds of brain, and they are born that way. Please take a moment, to examine the brain connection tissues, that change from our childhood to adulthood, and think about factors that can contribute to it. Of course, there are differences, in the brain between men and women. But brain plasticity is a critical factor in any comparison, 
not just between women and men. Even when we look at anatomical differences, they are also not black and white. Out of 116 regions in the gray matter, there are 10 of them, where women and men do differ from each other the most. So this study specifically looks at these 10 regions. And it turns out, even if we only focus on these small differences, they appear mosaic, combining both male and female structures. There is no such thing, as a male and a female brain. No one can tell if a brain is from a man or a woman. And if the brain is not male and female, we should not use it as an indicator, to justify male and female behaviors. So the take-home is, the brain of women and men, have more similarities than differences. For much of these differences, we are not sure if they come from nature, or nurture, born that way, or become that way. And we are not quite sure yet, about the impact of these differences in behaviors. If we only focus on differences, and cherry-picking evidence to fit our interpretation, we may risk justifying sexism, thinking that men, and women should be doing different jobs. The important thing is that, brain plasticity supports that self-fulfilling prophecy. We can turn thought and belief into reality. We can oversimplify, by putting it this way, the brain may have a capacity for both within hemisphere and cross hemisphere. But as a result of our repeated thought and behaviors, it could rewire and become dominant in only one direction. Let's come back to the executive on LinkedIn, who wrote that, because women have a different brain, their strength in negotiation and communication are beneficial for business. Despite good intention, his advice may make sexism worse in the workplace. Here is a more constructive way to apply brain science. Because of brain plasticity, both men and women can develop strength in negotiation and communication. Both men and women can cultivate stereotypical masculine and feminine traits, such as competitive, ambitious, caring, or empathy. We should develop a supportive culture for both men and women to maximize this plasticity. This reminds us that, at the individual level, while we are certainly the product of culture, we also have an incredible power to be the producer of our own values and behaviors. We can be dynamic and cultivate a multicultural mind. So let's take a moment to have a better look at the study we mentioned before. Here is the degree of male and femaleness in 10 out of 116 brain regions. Each horizontal line represents one person, and each column represents one brain region. For example, the man on this line mostly has female features in 10 regions. So as you can see, even when we only focus on differences, there is no way one can tell if a brain is male or female. The outward expressions are where masculinity and femininity show themselves in terms of words, symbols, and behaviors. First, we can recognize them by looking at how people express modesty or assertiveness. Here is a picture of the Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Root, on his bike. In this particular context, he is not showing off his status. One may say it's quite an interesting combination of feminine behavior and weak hierarchy acceptance. In contrast, President Trump from the U.S. is quite confident on his talent. He once described himself as really smart, actually a genius, and also a very stable genius. One may say this is an expression of quite a masculine behavior. Please take a moment to read his tweet and have your own judgment. Masculinity and femininity also differ in outward expressions of well-being versus competitiveness. Femininity is associated with the importance of issues such as work-life balance, consensus, health care, education, equality of life, a caring economy, sustainability, and endurance. Masculinity is associated with the importance of ambition, being number one, success, promotion, hard work, making bold promises, and being impressive. Here is an example of how these cultural elements have become survival strategies for a group of people called the Vikings. The stereotype we often hear about the Vikings in the past is that they were warlike and brutal. However, 
Scandinavian countries, are now associated with the best quality of life. They have been on top of the happiness index, years after years. One hypothesis is that, the Vikings have used cultural elements as survival strategies, to deal with the challenges of the modern world. They have shifted from a masculine way of life, to a feminine strategy, to survive and advance ahead of other countries. However, gender association, is not a bipolar system. It is possible, that seemingly opposing values co-exits. Masculinity, and femininity are also often intertwined. I see the modern Vikings as such a case. Beneath the femininity cover, it is a masculine spirit of striving for the best, and stay on top of the world. While both masculinity, and femininity are needed in all societies, we may wonder about the driving forces, that shape some cultures more towards masculine, or feminine values. Among many obvious factors, such as wars, trades, and cultural exchanges, I would like to add to this list my own hypothesis, which focuses on the impact of environmental and health challenges. Let's have a look at them, through the lens of family system. Here is the Tibetan family, that we saw in one of our previous slides. The woman is married, to several brothers. This, is an example of polyandry. In areas of the world with limited natural resources, polyandry is a useful cultural strategy. It helped humans hold land together, with fewer conflicts, fewer children, and better child care. This environmental challenge, might be one significant driver behind feminine values. The opposite of polyandry, is polygyny, one husband and multiple wives. It is still popular in many communities around the world. In this picture, teenagers from polygamous families, were demonstrating at a pro-plural marriage rally in the U.S. Way back in the past, this family structure, was probably a cultural response to rich natural resources. A big family size, would allows us to exploit and land more effectively. However, the consequences are plenty. First of all, traditional polygyny is prone to gender inequality, because wives are often not sisters, and partially subordinated to husbands. They are married off at a younger age, missing opportunities for education and social influence. Married life, is also prone to jealousy and competition for the husband's attention. Second of all, rich men with many wives, can boost their status and properties. They can create multiple social, economic, and political alliances. Polygyny makes a rich man richer still, while leaving other men sharing limited number of women and resources. This problem of excess men, has been linked to civil wars, raid, plunder, intergroup conflict, and robbing neighboring ethnic groups. Here in this picture, the author suggested a correlation between communities that practice polygyny, and the number of conflicts with neighboring groups. All in all, we can hypothesize that polygyny, as a cultural response to environment, might be a significant driver behind masculine values. Finally, when humans began to live closer to each other, in bigger community, they had to deal of a risk of sexually transmitted diseases, especially when on has many partners. The modern monogamy system, is probably a cultural response to this challenge. Monogamy, is often associated with better child care, and partner cooperation, which might have promoted feminine values. To conclude, gender association, is the extent to which people are associated with masculine, or feminine values, or both at the same time. Masculine traits are, competitiveness, ambition, independence, strength, and assertiveness. Feminine traits are, caring, modesty, gentleness, empathy, and sensitivity. However, the labels are misleading. These traits are unisex, or sexless, but the terminologies are gendered. It is also not helpful, to associate these traits with gender roles. Such an association perpetuates sexism. In this lecture, we put that sexism in the context of brain science. Neurosexism is the tendency, to interpret biology in ways that fit existing cultural stereotypes about gender. So at the universal level, everyone and every society needs both masculine and feminine values to advance. In our modern era, 
both sets of values are increasingly needed at the same time. More often than not, they are intertwined. At the collective level, the degree of importance depends on cultures, individuals, and particular context. At the individual level, each person has the potential to cultivate a multicultural mind, switching between masculinity and femininity, depending on different contexts. For outward expressions, we can recognize masculinity and femininity through the way people express modesty and assertiveness, well-being, and competitiveness. Masculine and feminine values have been dynamically shaped by many factors, such as wars, trades, cultural exchanges, environment, and health issues. In this lecture, we have looked at one example of how family structure evolved as a cultural strategy to deal with resources. As a result, systems of polyandry, polygyny, and monogamy could be among significant drivers of feminine and masculine values.